Okay, yay, she's here! Oh, I hope it's working. <gasps> Hello! Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good, oh man, it's nice to see your face again. It's been a while. Yeah, you too. I'm I'm really happy we get to do this because I was going to be at your event. I was going to go to your event in Petaluma. So I'm like, well, uh, this just... is almost as good. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I feel like that's the refrain about virtual events is like. But the good thing is it can be more global. <laughs> so there are bonuses. Yes, yes. Now we have people from all around the world here. So that's super yes. exciting. Um, how are things there? Are you in Chicago? I am. Yeah, they're good. It's, um, I have a lot of friends out in California and I'm a little jealous. I think that's where you are, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a little jealous because it's just so nice weather-wise. So like, you can go out and walk around and here it's still cold. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. We, it's, I won't tell you what the weather's like here right now. Um, okay. I, I'm very thankful for it. <laughs> have you taken up any new hobbies? I I haven't. I haven't. I've been with my parents because I was like, when I found out we were going to get shelter in place orders, I was like, I, I live by myself. And I was like, I think I'll go um, bananas if I'm staying at home alone. So um, suddenly I'm yeah. like a lot more like family time. So that's my new hobby. <laughs> what about you? Um, I've been baking as many people on the internet have been. Um, and I started to draw, maybe. Ooh. I can't draw at all. Like, full disclaimer, can't. <laughs> but you know what, though, I was just talking. I was just talking with another author this week, and she was saying how she took drawing classes, and she was like, "I didn't think I could draw at all," and then she was showing me these gorgeous drawings. I thought that was nice. Oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Okay, so should we do intros just in case anyone is just like accidentally randomly tuned in? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, do you want to introduce yourself or do you want me to introduce you? Yeah, I can start. Um, I'm Veronica Roth and I am the author of the Divergent series of books and then the Carve the Mark series and most recently, Chosen Ones, um, which is my first book for adult readers and it's about a group of people who saved the world when they were teenagers and now it's 10 years later and they're the most famous people on earth and they have a lot of issues. Um, <laughs> and they're still dealing with like the repercussions of what happened 10 years before, both, you know, psychologically, but also in the world around them. That's me. Okay. This is like totally just going off suddenly. Cause I have, I have my copy and it's from the U S um, yeah. and it has the beautiful, ah, the beautiful, it has the beautiful, like, starry right. thing on it. And is there a different version in the UK? Does Waterstones have a different version? Yeah. <gasps> That's the one I need. But no. really pretty. I, mean, I love this, but I'm also like, I think I need to get that one too. Yeah, they did a great job. Um, they're all really pretty. And the UK version's a little deeper blue and otherwise very much the same, but it has that special thing in the cover. Oh, I love that. I love their special surprises. Um, yeah. So for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Stephanie Garber. I'm the author of the Caraval series, which includes Caraval, Legendary, and Finale. Um, they're fantasy novels. I love fantasy and sci-fi. And um, Chosen Ones was one of my favorite books that I've read this year. So I'm super excited for this chat. Um, and before we start, just a reminder for anyone else who's read the book, please keep your comments spoiler free. Um, we don't want to spoil it. And I'm going to keep all my questions spoiler free, even though I, there's so many spoiler questions I want to ask. So, um, <laughs> another time <laughs> yeah, on spoiler free questions. So yeah, just a reminder for that. Um, great. Well, I suggested to you that we start off with a game, yes. which is a lightning round game um and it'll be this versus that trope so um it might be backwards i wrote them on paper but i don't know about my phone if it like reverses them so good luck reading backwards <laughs> if that's the case okay. but the first one is um enemies to lovers versus friends to lovers 
Ooh, enemies all the way, enemies. Yeah, me too. I that whole like fall in love with your best friend thing. It just like is cute, but and has never spoken to me as much as like the hate to love thing. Yeah, and I feel like I tried it when I was younger, and there was this guy, it was like I knew him my whole life, and I really, really wanted it to go there, and I just couldn't. I was just like, I just remember you from, like, you know, mm -hmm. when we yeah, were five. Our set, right? Yeah. Our, I actually, uh, my husband was a friend of mine, but it was never, like, a, a totally platonic friendship. It was always, like, there was distance, you know, like, we shouldn't yeah. get too close. So... Yeah. I think, yeah, I think that's different as opposed to like, you know, when it was like, you totally saw this person almost like a sibling. And then it's like, I feel like it's, it's hard to make that leap as opposed to the oh, kind of friend. Yes, I agree. Okay. Um, this one, <laughs> this one is, I'll show you, but it's fake relationship versus I love you, but my job is to kill you. <laughs> oh, that one's tough. You go first. I think I think I like fake relationship because of that, like, angst where you're like, oh, now we have to kiss. But I don't know if they mean it, but I mean it. <laughs> but I like the other one, too. <laughs> yeah, I feel like it's so, I think, I think it's so torn because I feel like if it's, like, my job is to kill you, like, it can, you can kill the tension if it's not, like, I actually want to kill you. But if it's that kind of, like, I'm marrying you because I hate you and I plan to, like, stab you in your sleep. Um, I really, I really, really like that. Yeah, there's something nice about that one. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, guys, this is only about fiction, just to clarify, not yeah. about real <laughs> Okay, um, this one should be good. All right, uh, this is makeover versus secret royalty. <gasps> Ooh. Congrats, you're a princess, Princess Diary style. Or like the because I love I recognize the problematic nature of a makeover in fiction. Like you're not good enough when you weren't pretty or whatever. But I do love it. <laughs> so Well, and I think yeah, and it's and I love I love them both. I love the secret princess. I like I'm such a sucker for Princess Diaries, which combines them both. It's like yes, oh. it does. <laughs> they often go hand in hand. I didn't think about that. But I'm with you. Secret royalty is better. Mm -hmm. Always. Like, I will always watch any Hallmark where it's like, and he's secretly a prince. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> Score. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, okay, this is a, an interesting distinction to make, but anti-hero versus hot villain. Ooh. Ooh. So, you know, reluctant hero. I think that's my preference. So, like, a Han Solo figure versus, like, a hot villain figure. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's so, I'm like, I still, I still am hung up on like the dark lane, which just shows what a mess I am as a human. Yeah, I was never, I was never on team dark lane. I was always on team storm Hund or Nikolai. Okay, yeah. But yeah. Sort of like a rogue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, he was a much better choice than the Darkling. The Darkling was, like, the worst. But I think I just, I think I like that, like, <laughs> I think I like things that are just all sorts of problem and <laughs> Listen, this is a safe place. <laughs> you don't oh, need to yeah. just find I, love, here. I love the hot villain. Um, but it's not like I necessarily want them to get together. I think it just creates a whole different level of tension of, like, oh. I kind of yes. want you, but I really do need to defeat you. There's a whole thing, like, I, I, there's a lot of things I like, but I don't want them to end up being, like, canon exactly, yeah. you know? Like, I don't want the Darkling to, like, change his ways and become a good dude, and then they, like, ride off to the sunset. Like, that's not the appeal, so I get it. Yeah, well, like, I was, I don't want to spoil anything, but, like, Kylo Ren, I was there for it, and I was also very happy with how things ended. Yes. I didn't mind the ending. I, we, let's not get into Star Wars. Yeah, we won't go I have like but a lot of feelings. <laughs> but no, I was good with the ending. I was like, this is how it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then the last one is uh, special powers versus chosen one. Sometimes these go together, but chosen one is usually like fate determined. 
and special powers is just special powers. I'm and I'm all for the chosen one because I feel like I would want to be the chosen one. Like, who doesn't want like a prophecy, even though it's probably going to ruin your life? Like, it'll <laughs> make the... it a more exciting life. So I pick chosen one. I think. So I know I wrote a whole book about Chosen Ones, <laughs> but I might be in Team Special Power because that moment where, like, all the stuff that's involved with it, like a training sequence where you learn how to master your power and, like, you find out that you're special, but also then you have to choose, like, whether to use it for good or ill. Like, I really love that stuff. So I think these two are, like, right up there with me. Yeah, me. those are tough. I do, I think I love reading about, like, I love reading the training sequences. I love it, especially when it's kind of like, ooh, I have a crush on my mentor. Um, but Vampire Academy style. <laughs> yes, Dimitri. But they're so hard for me to write that I think that's where, like, I don't like rules. And I feel like you need to have, like, rules for powers to work. Oh, you don't like rules. Ah. Man, I love rules. Oh, they're so hard for, they're hard for me. I like following them, but I don't like creating them. They're hard for me to create because... I don't like to make decisions. I understand what you mean. You know, when you write a whole draft and you're like, wow, I just chose not to make choices <laughs> about this. <laughs> yes, that is the st that's the story of my life. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, wait, are there any others? Or can we talk a little more about tropes in terms of chosen ones, the book? Yeah. No, that was it. Okay. Thanks for indulging me. <laughs> I love that game. I well, I just love I love tropes. I pick up books based on the trope. Um, like, I mean, which is one of the reasons I'd been so excited about Chosen Ones because I was like, ooh, I have never seen this explored from this angle. Like, I've seen all the Chosen Ones, but like, what happens to them afterwards? Um, so I want to know why you think the Chosen One trope is so beloved and what you love the most about exploring it in this book. Well, as far as why it's beloved, it's sort of hard to say. I've been thinking about this a lot, obviously, because of this book. <laughs> but um, for me, it's because there's a lot going on that's interesting there. So there's the, like, you're set apart for a special destiny, which, like, when I was a kid, that's all I wanted was to have a special destiny. And then, um, but also there's, like, the moment when they have to decide whether to embrace it or let it go but they can't let it go because it's their fate, right? So, like, do you choose it? Does it matter? Um, I like that. And then there's they're kind of, like, lonely and tortured, you know, because it's, like, only I can carry this burden, you know? And I love, like, that um, kind of emotional reality, I think. If I find it interesting for a character to be kind of shouldering something really heavy um, and doing it by themselves or in a small group, as is the case in some Chosen One stories and mine. Um, but I do think the interplay between, like, I want to be special, but I'm kind of relieved that I'm not, is, like, a factor here. Yeah. You want a special destiny, but you also want to be able to stay home and be safe and <laughs> not die. You know, <laughs> that would be nice. So, um, but you asked, there was a second part to your oh, question. Oh, yeah, and what did you love the most about exploring it in this book? Thanks. Sorry, hold on. I, I had to scroll through the thing, and then I started typing. Um, what did I like? I think I liked mostly, I think my favorite part was like the fame part. Um, because I, so like recently I saw a fan art of Harry Potter and it's like Harry Potter in the Tesco, which is like a grocery store. And I was just like, how would that even happen? And, um, like how would he be able to resume any kind of normalcy at that point? And that was the question that I was so interested in addressing with this was just like, Sloan, my main character Sloan, who's like very resentful of her fame, has a moment where she's like, well, if I were to date anyone outside of this circle of people, like at what point do I tell them like I saved the world? You know, <laughs> like, is that like a fourth date question or like a third date? Um, so it's like, how do you resort, resume any kind of normalcy, especially when you weren't trained or educated in anything that could give you like a job at that point? Like your job was save the world and you did it, but it doesn't pay. You know, so just the practicalities of it, I think, were really interesting. And the trauma of it, um, which, you know, I didn't take lightly, but I was just interested in what it would be like at 
to be called upon at any point after you had done such an intense thing to do anything else ever again. Like, how would you react and how would you be able to face that again? Um, so all of that was, was kind of like wrapped up in my enjoyment of this book. Well, I love the way you explored it. Like there was a moment I think where Sloan was like struggling and maybe it was more than one moment, like with the idea of like feeling like she'd already peaked, like saved the world 10 years ago. What are you doing? <laughs> like, yeah, how do you top that? You can't. <laughs> yeah, like you're 20 years old, you saved the world. Um, and I also, I love the way you explored the fame and just kind of like, one of the things I thought was so fascinating was like, you opened it up with this interview with this really biased guy. I think I wrote his name down, Rick Lake. And he gave one perception of Sloan. And then we get to see Sloan through Matt's eyes. And it's like, you know, kind of, it's a very different perception and kind of rose colored. And then we see Sloan's perception of herself, which is very different than how the public sees her um, and how her boyfriend sees her. And so I'm kind of curious how you saw her um, and how you approached writing her. Well, oh, that's good. That's a good question, how I saw her. Um, so she kind of presents herself as like this tough person who doesn't care what people think about her. And she's like too cool for social media and all that stuff. And I am definitely like rolling my eyes at her at that point. I'm like, you definitely care. And you are definitely not too cool for all this stuff. And you need to get over yourself a little bit. But I also approach her with like, deep sympathy and affection, I think. Um, so she's like, she's very angry. And for good reason. And she also is uh, clever. So I like that she's resourceful and smart. Um, and so I had a lot of like, ah, yeah. I loved, I think she was like a little sister to me um, in a way when I was writing her. So it's like, I wanted to see her flaws. And I think she is a very flawed character, um, which was important to me because I feel like when I was growing up, most chosen ones were men and women weren't really like anti-heroes uh, when I was reading things growing up. Obviously now that's changed and become way more... Um, like diverse you can find all kinds of female characters and all kinds of characters period which is great but um but i think it was important for me as a writer to explore what it would actually be like for her to be an anti-hero because um even when like it's hard for us to let our female characters go there because the criticism of them from a lot of readers is very harsh and uh i just wanted i, I don't know i thought it would be kind of cathartic um, and that it was important to contribute in some small way to like expanding our ideas of what some sympathetic characters can be like. So yeah. I felt like she was so like, I felt like she was that perfect balance of all those things that it's like, Ooh, would make her unlikable, but she was so relatable. I felt she was so real. <laughs> like I believed her. I was like, I, I felt for her and I loved that she was like, I don't know if the word's like gritty. But the, I love that she had these feelings, you know, I love that, I don't want to spoil anything, but I love that she had these feelings, where, like, it's like, this should seem like it's all great and rosy, and she's like, no, I'm really not happy. Yeah. Um, and I, I just thought she was really, like, fascinating. Well, I'm glad you liked her. <laughs> she was fun to follow. Um, okay, one of my favorite things about the book, and this is where I'm like, oh, I wish we could be spoilery, but I'm not going to be spoilery for everyone who hasn't read it, is the world building. Ah. Yeah, so I've been tiptoeing around this, and I kind of know how to do it. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. Because I, um, I wanted to talk about it. And one of the things, like, you know, that, like, you have an alternate Chicago, obviously, because there was a dark one and chosen ones who saved the world um and i love like i love anything that takes our world and veers off course and goes through an alternate timeline you know but it also feels like this could happen um but i thought how did you approach that like how did you decide where to deviate from the timeline and how far to go in terms of making it a different world well this was like one of the greatest tasks of the book so i'm glad that you had to have um, but I knew that, uh, in order to create like an alternate reality that feels even somewhat familiar to our own, it has to be pretty recent. So I was like, all right, let's look at what happened in the last like 50, 60 years, you know? Um, I think it's actually 70 years, 
but whatever. Okay. It's, you know, in a century that I recognize, what, what was a point of deviation? And I knew it, um, I kind of just decided, I think because I was watching, I was watching this documentary from like the 80s uh, called For All Mankind or To All Mankind. Um, there's a couple things by that title, but this one is like, found, it's a bunch of footage from the NASA um, like journey to the moon, basically. So it's just a compilation of like old footage. Um, and I think I was like, oh, I'll just do the space race. <laughs> so that, that was like where my point of deviation was. So I decided in this alternate universe, instead of racing with Russia to get to the moon, we were like trying to explore the depths of the ocean because we don't know very much about them. Um, and uh, also because the space race was really about the development of ballistic missile technology. It's not really about like, no one cared about getting to the moon. They all cared about having more sophisticated weapons than the other guy. And so you can do that in, in any way, you know, like you don't have to go to the moon to do that. And anyway, this is all like getting convoluted, sorry. But I, at that point, I was like, okay, if we diverge at that point, then I need to know like kind of a rundown of everything that happened in our universe up until the present in various categories, such as design, um, design and architecture and computers and technology and politics. So, so anyway, what I'm telling you is that I did a lot of research and then I had to make a lot of decisions like we're talking about um, with world building. Yeah. So yeah that sounds well you can tell you did a lot of research and like it feels like that it felt like very believable and i couldn't imagine right Do i um, i wondered uh when you were writing your series did you what do you remember one of the decisions that you like didn't make in a rough draft and then you had to go back and fix oh, it let me see oh there's a lot okay so i i mean there's a decision i didn't make um in a book <laughs> it because it was with Caravel with my first book it was um like there's magic and I was like I want it to be really accessible so I'm not gonna give it rules because I feel like you know I don't feel like magic would have strict rules I feel like it would be like different people would see it in a different way so I'm just gonna say it runs on like emotion and time and blood and it, it worked for one book, but then when I got into the sequel and I was like, wow, I, I also do have like a main character with powers, like Legend had these powers, which I didn't define and I didn't put rules around because I had been like, no rules. And um, I'm thinking back to past Stephanie and I'm like, oh no, <laughs> poor, poor writer. I, yeah, I thought it was so like, I thought like leaving it open was going to make it easier for me in the future, but it was like, no, I needed to like really like give myself parameters like a fence so um, I totally get this by the way I totally did this with certain things in the Divergent series and then I got to the third book and I was like oh <laughs> whoops <laughs> nobody tells you nobody's like sending you letters being like oh turn around <laughs> like yeah stop stop now <laughs> don't leave it so wide open explain a little more early on <laughs> Well, let this be a lesson to anyone who is a writer and who is watching. You should define rules for your magic system. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I feel like I'm much better at being like, here are the guidelines now. Like, or I think I am. The good thing is, you've learned all those lessons. And I mean, the books are still wonderful. So, you know, this is not such a, this is not such a horrible thing. Yeah, yeah. But it is a good lesson in like making choices. And like, even if it's the wrong way, it's like, at least I know where that choice is, you know, and and you can go back. Um, okay, so one of the like uh, um, other questions I had were there any? Okay, did you? Okay, first, did you ever watch the TV show Fringe? Yes. Okay. I watched the first season. Okay, I'm just thinking a lot about Fringe because it has the alternate world, the parallel um, universes. Yeah. Yes, and well, it, it. yes, with like the <laughs> with all the dirigibles, and so I was just wondering as you wrote this book, were there any like other alternate ideas for Chicago that you had that didn't make it in? Um, things you played around with, like dirigibles? Um, well, the original, like, draft of the book, the very, very, like, proto-draft, um, the alternate universe was, was more like a fantasy world. Uh -huh. So it was supposed to be our world, but it was t very different feeling. Okay. Yeah, more like high fantasy feeling. And um, 
I think I just did that as like a shorthand and I didn't really think about what the repercussions would be. And then when I sat down to actually do it, I realized I wanted it to be more grounded because I wanted to dig into the history and the technology and the design and stuff like that. And I didn't want to build something that felt so unfamiliar. And so um, that was kind of the alternate that I played with the most. But I was, yeah, and the other problem was, I was like, well, at what point would they diverge in order to create such a fantastical world? And would they even still speak English at that point? Like, you know, the history of it required then so much more research yeah. um, into eras that I wasn't as interested in. So that was part of the reason that I changed it. But other than that, like, I pretty much committed to what I had, you know. But, well, and it worked what you had. I was just curious if it was like, you know, there were other Chicagos with, I have. Yeah, the sliding door scenario of every book. Yes, I know. exactly. <laughs> Um, okay, one of the other things I wanted to ask about was, was your use of magical objects. Um, I am such a sucker for magical objects. And I, okay, I confess, I never even heard of, I might say this wrong, Ko Koshi's needle? How do you say it? Yeah, Koshi. Koshi. Okay. Yeah. How, can we talk a little bit about this and how you like chose that and your other objects? Um, yeah, so um, Koshi's needle, I didn't know about either before this, just for the record, but I was, I, I knew I wanted like to do that thing, which is a trope, which is like that thing you thought was a legend is actually true. Oh. Um, but I thought, so I kind of tried to think about what kinds of countries or cultures that would like the US would be in cooperation with to like take their, their mythical objects in ways that wouldn't be like horrible. Um, so they had to be like other Western cultures because I just didn't want to like start mining other marginalized <laughs> communities for their legendary objects. Um, and so anyway, that's, those were kind of the parameters that I used. Um, and I am Polish, my family's Polish anyway. So um, I am first generation American from here. Uh, and so I went to like Eastern European mythology because I thought that would be cool. And also then if we have their mythical objects, it goes back to like the Cold War. So anyway, obviously that was like an area of interest. And I discovered Koshi's Needle and it actually reminded me of Voldemort and the Horcruxes because Koshi, by legend, takes his soul and puts it in a needle and then puts that in an egg and puts it in a duck and or sometimes a hair and then sometimes in a box. <laughs> it's like depending on the legend. Is that like where the Nesting dolls came from? Yeah, I don't know, um, but it seems that way. And I found that to be like so charming and weird. And um, and I liked, I mean, there's a creep factor in the needle, right? Like it's, I find, I'm not afraid of needles at all, but I find them to be like this sort of visceral. And that's kind of nice because this needle like gets buried in Sloan's hand and to catastrophic effect. <laughs> um, and it's kind of horrible that way, but so that's kind of why I picked it. I liked the story and I thought it was appropriately horrifying. That is, so, that is, yeah, it was definitely appropriately horrifying and fascinating. <laughs> and it went with all those things. Like it felt like very like, of course, of course our government would be looking for the, you know, magical objects. Like Indiana Jones taught us that, so. Yes, <laughs> has Indiana Jones taught us nothing? <laughs> um, okay, so just like, before we switch gears from um, your world building, what was the most, since you did a lot of research, what was the most interesting thing you learned in your research? That makes oh, man. You make it let, me, let me get my research journal. So I only kept it like up to a point. So this is really not as impressive as it seems, but there was like the space race and sonar stuff. Um, <clears throat> what was the most interesting thing? It's hard, uh, because I've kind of forgotten a lot of this. <laughs> but I think, um, I think what I liked was understanding what the internet and what computers were before they became like our personal devices, because they were way more like for science and math minded people. And it was like a, a card catalog, basically. <laughs> um, and so that was really interesting. I wish I could give more concrete stuff about that. But also, um, I learned about the SOFAR channel, which here, okay. It is a part, a depth of the ocean at which 
like the sound speed minimum creates a sound channel at which sound waves can travel long distances. So you can hear farther at a certain point in the ocean because of your depth. Ooh. Yeah. And so we did actually like implant or like plant hydrophones in the ocean to like listen in on our enemies at certain points in the past, which is wild. Yeah. Ooh, that, it makes me think of those, like, places where it's, like, you're supposed to, I think there's, like, a Smithsonian, in the Smithsonian, like, you're supposed to be able to stand in one corner and whisper something that the other, someone, yeah. it's never worked for me, but. Sound is wild. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is. And I just, okay, um, someone had asked a question while you were talking, if they shouldn't be watching this, if they haven't read Chosen One, so for anyone tuning in late. Oh, no, we're good, yeah. Yeah, we're keeping this spoiler-free, um, even though I want to ask all the spoilery questions and have all the spoilery answers, but keeping it spoiler free. Uh, okay, so we're going to, so romance. I'm going to, I'm going to go back to tropes, because um, I don't want to spoil any specifics on the romance, which I loved. Um, I also love romance tropes. They're like my favorites. Me too, yeah. <laughs> I love them. I will pick out my books like based on like what romantic trope they will have a lot of times. Um, do you write like an archive of our own tag, basically? Yeah, that's what I would Yeah, pretty much. It's like, oh, you know, it's like not necessarily the plot, it's just like, can I please have something where it's like a fake marriage or fake dating or you know, anything mm -hmm. arranged marriage yeah. for reasons? Yeah, <laughs> it's just like I'll look it up and I'll be like, this is what I'm in the mood for. Mm -hmm. Do you do you write your romance with tropes in mind? And if so, how do you approach it? Um, or do you just let it happen organically? Um, sometimes I will, like at the kind of conceptual stage of the book, I'll be like, okay, what kind of dynamic do I want this to be? Um, which I did with Divergent because at the time, so, you know, everything has its context, right? So when I wrote Divergent, that was in the time of like the love triangle, right? So the reason Divergent doesn't have a love triangle is because there were a lot of love triangles and I was tired of it, <laughs> like personally. Now I love love triangles, actually, so I'm back on board. But it was just, you know, when something is saturating your reading material, you're kind of like, all right, I don't want to do that right now. Um, so sometimes I will kind of do a reaction or to my past stuff. So, you know, if there was a particular dynamic in Carve the Mark, which was kind of like a rivals to friends to lovers situation and a little bit of a Romeo and Juliet situation, I might want to not do that or... I might want to do it again. <laughs> so I won't say which, because I don't want to spoil anything. But um, I do think about kind of what context I'm writing it to recently, and what I've really liked in the books that I've read recently, and would love to explore myself and stuff like that. So, um, do you write with troops in mind? I you know, okay. I don't, but I will. Like I. I realized after writing like Caraval and Legendary both had fake um Caraval had a fake dating relationship and then Legendary no fake was it fian oh they each had a fake fiance like two back-to-back -back fake fiancés in the books and I was like how did no one tell me that I did this um you must just like you love a fake relationship I do. you love it <laughs> I do. so like I I hadn't like plotted it, but now I'm a little more mindful. Um, I think just because I, I wasn't as mindful and now I'm probably like think a little too much about like, Ooh, what do I want to do? And how do I want to do this? Like kind of like the thing where it is like what you were saying about love triangles. Like I, um, I threw a love triangle in finale because I'd been missing them and I'm a huge sucker for love triangles. Like I, I love them and I see them as like, I see them as a choice for the heroine. It's like, you get to choose between this or this, like not necessarily just like the idea of like, <gasps> yeah, yeah, it's like her path or his path, not, not about who they're picking so yeah. much. Yeah, yes, exactly. So, I mean, I think, I think it's just so fun to do it. So it's kind of like that and definitely like what I'm enjoying reading. Like a lot of times it's like, if I read something and I get a feeling that I love, then it's like, that's what I want to try and create. So yeah very similar to what you were saying like yeah I I love writing romance and I love reading it and I love reading books when I don't know who the romantic interest is going to be that's one of yep. my favorite things so um I I want to um just because I'm seeing some stuff please even keep divergent spoilers out of this chat please be respectful of your fellow attendees that's all 
Okay. Ooh, <laughs> yes, that is that is a good reminder. Okay, so another another trope that um that I really love, and I love how you did it um in this book is the friend squad. I love it when it's like a group of friends or a group of people who are working together who might not necessarily come together in other circumstances. So how did you put together, like approach putting together this squad of chosen ones? Um, like the, like creating them, did you decide like who they were afterwards first or who they were before first? Does that make sense? I, yeah, it totally does. Um, I decided who they were afterward, basically. So, um, I basically revolve them because you have to just pick a point at which you like understand the characters or not. And the point that I chose was how they related to fame. Um, so I knew that Sloane would be resentful of it because that was just the foundation of her character, basically. Um, and I knew that Matt, her boyfriend, would be like the golden boy kind of. So he would take it on as like a responsibility. And that's you know, because he feels he has, like, a moral obligation to do something with his platform. And um, so that was him squared away. And then I was like, well, one of them has to love it, right? <laughs> and that had to be Esther. So Esther is uh, in this, like, 10 years later universe. She has started a lifestyle brand called Essie Says um, on uh, the fake Instagram, <laughs> which <laughs> was really fun because, you know, someone – in any group of people, like, there's someone who wants to be famous, right? Um, and then with Inez and Albie, I figured it would be good for them to be buddies, kind of, and also to have, like, lingering fear and paranoia related to everybody knowing who they are and, um, and related to living, like, their formative years in danger. So they kind of both express that a little bit, but Inez is a little more, like, making jokes about it, and Albie is very much, like, really struggling with it in a profound way. Um, so that's kind of how I started developing them. And then obviously they take on another life, um, as you write, but that's like, that was the starting point. And I do love, oh, like a found family or a group that has a history and banter and, you know, all that stuff. Well, and they were such a fun group. Like I loved Esther and her Instagram and all of that. Like I felt like it was great and I loved Inez and her, her booby trap department and like, <laughs> It felt like, it felt so believable. Like, it felt like this would be a really warped, like, you know. Well, everyone's thing. got that friend who's like, let's take a picture of this food for the gram. <laughs> and you're like, all right, <laughs> fine, or I'll eat it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think that it, it pretty, it pretty much makes sense. And we all know someone who doesn't want to be on there and yeah, mm -hmm. everything. Um, okay, another thing that, like, I didn't have, like, a tropey kind of question for you on this but that I loved was the pieces that you put together the different pieces of media in the box um with the interviews and the excerpts from books and the redacted documents and how like you were telling different layers of a story um how did you decide to do that and how did you decide which ones to a which pieces to include with that well, um, we've been calling them interstitials. That's my editor Ooh, what decided that? what we call them. Interstitials. Interstitials? Yeah. I like it. Yeah. So, yes, they are, like, excerpts from government documents and textbooks, and there's a poem in there, and there's a stand-up quote, and there's a bunch of stuff. But um, I originally put them in because I knew that we needed to understand what happened kind of, like, 10 years before because you can't understand like what they're doing now or why they're reacting the way they are to certain things unless you know those things. But I also didn't want it to be told via flashbacks because then too much of the story becomes about the battle that came before. And that's not what the concept of this book is. So the documents felt like a way to reveal stuff from the past, but then also because Sloan has requested those documents in the narrative, she is reacting to them while we are reacting to them. So she's finding out things about her past that she wasn't aware of at the time. And I thought that was a good way to keep it from feeling like we were being dragged away from the narrative every time that one of these comes up. And then I wasn't necessarily going to continue them through the rest of the book, but then it felt like a missed opportunity to not have them because 
there's, I mean, I don't want to spoil anything, but there's a lot more to know about this world. And not all of it is like easy to reveal via Sloane's point of view. So um, I continued them kind of for that reason. And I didn't like eliminate any, I only added them throughout. And sometimes it would be like an idea I came up with while I was writing like, oh, that would be like that thing I mentioned would be a good document. And then sometimes it was my editor suggesting, like, I think you need to do a product review. It's like, okay, John, I will do that. Um, and so it was, uh, it was kind of a combination of things. But it's, uh, I never, like, have too much for a book. I only have, like, not enough that I, and more that I added. So that's why I so rarely have, like, deleted scenes or anything like that. I just, like, don't do that. So um, there are, like, no extra documents at all. Wow. <laughs> Okay, yeah. but I can I can understand that. I don't usually have many deleted scenes either. I'm it's very like you need to add ten thousand more words to this, and I'm like it's all there. <laughs> but I love yeah, the talk. I'm so glad you continued them. Like some of my favorite ones were because I was like, wow, oh my gosh. This I don't want to say anything that's spoilery, but I really I'm really glad you continued them because that was just a that was just a really great other layer. Um, Thanks. So. Yeah, someone in the sorry, someone in the chat was asking what genre Caraval is, and it is fantasy, my friends. And you should read it. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, it, okay, so I want to make sure we have time for questions from all the lovely people hanging out with us. But first, oh, first I have something very important to say, and then another question. Um, my dad wanted me to make sure that I told you how much he loved the book. Um, cause after oh. I read chosen ones, when I like came here for quarantine, I was like, dad, you should read, you should read this book. I was like, I've given him like all my Blake Crouch books and I'm like, you love this. And he was just like, he got so depressed He's like, <laughs> when it was over, he loved it. So he wanted me to tell you, um, that he loved it. And so for him and everyone else who reads it and then feels kind of bereft that it's over, what books would you recommend they read after chosen ones? Oh man, this is a great question. Um, okay, well, Sean and McGuire has a series of novellas. The first one's called Every Heart a Doorway. And they are about like the aftermath of kids who get like sucked into portal fantasies, basically. So like Alice in Wonderland top style. And they're, the, so they're great. They're like winking at you, but then they also take the emotional reality seriously, which is important. Um, so those are great. I'm trying to think, I'm staring at my bookshelves right now. Uh, the, there's an older one by Diana Wynne Jones, which I don't know how, I think it will hold up just fine because it's Diana Wynne Jones, but it's lesser read and it's called The Dark Lord of Dirkholm. <laughs> and it's, I'm writing it down. Oh, oh yeah. So it's about um, a fantasy world that there has been a portal to like our world and they, our world has been using this fantasy world as like a playground, basically, or like an amusement park. But the people there actually live there and this like destroys their lives every year and this year they've had enough <laughs> so um that's like the premise of the book and it's great it's so like super fun um and gosh is there anything else i'm trying to think of other like playful kind of like tropey trope books but yeah that, that those might be the ones that come to mind first i'm probably missing some super obvious ones that i'm gonna kick myself <laughs> Those, yeah, I haven't read those. I have the Sean and McGuire one on my Kindle. Um, and so now I'm like, okay, I need to get that because I've heard great things about it. Yeah, and because they're novellas, I think they're perfect for right now because, like, I don't know about you, but I'm having trouble focusing on something longer right now. So I just need, like, something I can read in one sitting. And you can definitely read them in, like, a couple hours. So... Yes, I agree. I feel like I've read I've read just a couple of books over the last month. Um, but it is like I'm not good at picking up something and then putting it down. My concentration goes out the window. So it all sound good. Oh, someone said, what's the second recommendation? And it's The Dark Lord of Dirk Holm, <laughs> Diana Wynne Jones. And then the other one was Every Heart a Doorway by Sean and McGuire. Diana Wynne Jones is brilliant. Okay, did we want to take any questions from, do we want to take the scrolling question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you can, can you navigate the scroll? Cause I've yes. been- Yes, okay. So I'm going through the scrolling. 
Um, okay. Um, ooh, okay. Will you reveal the title of book two soon? Oh, <laughs> I don't think that will happen soon. No. <laughs> I have a title in mind, but I don't think I can share it for a long time. Is there anything you Let's can see. tell us about it? Is there? Well, it will still be from Sloan's perspective. So there's that. Um, no, I don't think there's anything else I can say. <laughs> Well, it's I never written again, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to promise anything and then have it not work. Okay. So here's one. Cause I didn't ask like this question. Normally I do. What is one tip you would give writers? Ooh, sorry. Can you repeat that? You cut what out a little bit. What is one tip you would give writers? Oh yeah. Um, you know, I could give more like esoteric tips about the writing life, but I think one of the tips I got and in case it helps anyone, I'll share it which is if you can't figure out your ending, don't introduce anything new. Look at what you set up in your beginning. And um, that has helped me through a couple books now because the stuff that you found interesting there has inevitable repercussions that should come to bear on the plot. And so if you're getting lost, you can always look at what you already have. Ooh, that is really good advice. That is really good advice. Ooh. What about you? Do you have a tip? Um, what is my tip? I... Okay, I'm in the revision process right now. So I just finished um, and someone asked if I could talk about my next book, which I can't. Um, but I just got notes back. I just got two different sets of notes back on it from two different people. Um, and I think it's important like when you're getting feedback to make sure people understand what you're trying to do. Um, and that they're not like pushing you to write a different book because I think there's a lot of different ways to tell every story. Like there's so many different yeah. ways. So I think just knowing like who where to get feedback from is really important because I know for me like I can't write a book on my own like I need to like bounce ideas off of people and I need critique and so I think it's really important to make sure that the people you're sharing with your ideas understand what you're trying to do so they can help you try to tell the right story um so rather than taking all the feedback like get the feedback from the people who know what you're trying to do so I think one way, I think that's like very good advice because you're right. There are so many different ways to approach things. And sometimes people get attached to the story you're not telling. And it's like, well, that's not like, that's not helpful to me. Sorry. <laughs> um, and so one way to find out if they understand what story you're telling is to ask them what they like about it and what they don't like. And if the things that they like are the same things that you like. Yeah. That is good. Yeah. 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 And it is definitely so true. People have definitely, it's like, they want you to tell like this other part of the story. And it's like, I'm glad you love that, but that's a whole Yeah, thing. but I'm not going to do that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, I saw a question that was that we could both answer, which is, um, can you talk about the relationship between an editor and an author and how do you handle disagreements? Cause I, I get this question a lot and I think people are under the impression that like, if an editor tells you to do something, you have to do it. Like you don't get a choice and they're afraid to give their writing over to someone like with that level of control. Anyway, do you have any in thoughts about this? Ooh, yeah. Um, I mean, for me and my editor, it is very like every time she sends me an edit letter, she's always like, you don't have to take any of this or anything. But I think, and I would imagine a lot of editors are like this, like my editor, um, it's very much like, I feel like whenever she points out something isn't working, it's not. Um, her solutions are not necessarily the correct solutions. Like, I feel like a lot of people, like, even if I'll give advice to a friend, it's like, I'll try and like, say like, this is what I'm thinking you should do to illustrate what I'm thinking. But it's like, I don't think this is even the right choice, but just so you can see how I'm feeling and responding. So it's like, if my editor responds to something and think it needs to be fixed, then I will always look at that and see like where it went wrong. But sometimes it's like, I had a scene in finale that was towards the end of the book and it wasn't working. And it was this big emotional scene. But the problem was I hadn't set up the relationship right. The problem wasn't that I'd written the scene wrong. It was that the, the building blocks, the foundation of it wasn't there. So I had to fix the scene by going back earlier in the book. So sometimes it's like really looking at the heart of what they're saying. Because I feel like usually if someone tells you something's not working, it's not. But their solution's not always right. And my editor, um, in my experience, is just always really like you know, she doesn't expect me to do what she says or anything. Like, I feel like she's there to help. Like they want to make the book better. It's not like they want to control it. 
Yeah, yeah. I have a very similar comment about it, which um, I use this comparison, which bear with me, it's a little weird, but I went to a chiropractor once where he ran a little thermometer down my spine to see where the hot spots were. Basically, like there's a slight uptick in temperature when things are wrong was his theory. I don't know if it's scientifically accurate, but you know. Um, and I think of notes that way. So like they always point out hot spots. They do not necessarily tell you even accurately like what is wrong in those spots mm -hmm. or how to fix them for sure. But I always pay attention to like the hot spots that my editor is pointing out because usually what they're sensing is that a decision has not been made. As we talked about, this is a big problem. <laughs> Um, or that like something isn't working, it hasn't been set up properly, it's not paying off the way I want it to, it's not written in the right way, it's slow, it's, you know, like, it could be any of those problems, and you figure out what those problems are, and when I return my draft to my editor, I will either explain which notes I took and how, or, or I'll explain, like, how I addressed the problem, even if it isn't the way that they suggested or even would expect, <laughs> um, so yeah, this idea that like your editor controls the book is not, I mean, that's not how it works with anyone. This is a, it's always a collaborative relationship. It should be, if it's not, then, you know, you've got deeper problems, but I haven't really heard of that happening much. And if you feel really strongly about it, most of the time, like you might have to have a fight about it, uh, like, you know, a good natured like argument, but, um, but no one's there to like take your book away from you. So yes, yes, that is those are really good words. No one is trying to take your book away. Um, okay. Do you have a favorite character that you've written? That was one of the questions that popped up as you were talking. Oh, man. Um, man, this is hard. <laughs> Not really. Like, I, I really love the main characters the most. That's why I choose to write about them. Um, and if I didn't like them the most, I probably would, written, would have written the book from other perspectives. But... Um, yeah, so I guess my favorites are like Sloan, Tris, and Syra because they're my my main gals. Um, I know Akos is technically a POV, and so is Tobias in the Divergent series, but I'm always like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> this book isn't yours. <laughs> um, and yeah, you, like even Syra, she has twice the amount of words in that series than Akos does. So. But recently, yeah, I love Sloan a lot. Um, I think she she's occupying a special part of me because she felt a little like wish fulfillment in a lot of ways. Like I wish I could be, um, so like, she just does not like change her behavior in order to make other people like her. And I think that that's like suggests real strength. And I really like that about her. So I, yeah. I feel like that's also like good writing advice. Like if your character, if your main character feels kind of like wish fulfillment, then you're probably on the right track with your main character. Maybe, yeah. You know, I feel like I love reading about those characters that are saying the things I wouldn't say and doing the things that I would never do. And I feel like those are the characters that are so fun to get behind. Yeah, um, as long as they're also suffering the repercussions for those things, I think that's pretty important. Because it's like, wish fulfillment has a cost. Yes. Right? Yeah. What is your favorite, like, main characters aside? Who's your favorite character in your series? Oh, my favorite character is probably Jax, who um, showed up in the second book, and he's um, he's one of the villains, and he... You love a villain. <laughs> I do, I do, and this character has caused me so much problem, many problems, because when I created him in the second book, I was really, like, obsessed with the idea of, like, um, a jack of hearts coming to life from a deck of cards and, like, being evil and... Um, and then I wrote a whole book about him and my editor and agent were like, Hey, what happened to Caraval? Like, <laughs> who is this character? And so I had to rewrite the book. So it wasn't just about him. Um, and so. Well, that's a sign though. Yeah. But he's a character. Yeah. Yeah. So he's my favorite. He does like all the worst things and says all the worst things. And I think I love characters like that because they really push the buttons of like my main characters. So I like the characters that push my main character's buttons the most. Um, I like it. <laughs> so I like, I like torturing them. I'm not as nice to my, I'm not very nice. I was going to say as nice, but I'm like, no, you're terrible to your main characters. They have oh, yeah. horrible. I mean, this is common to all writers because if there isn't something bad happening to the main character, then there is no story. And you might as well just read like some barista AU and like relax. There's nothing wrong with that, but I'm just saying that's not what books are for. Yeah. Um, so you have to have conflict. 
And then you get to watch them come out of it, okay? And that's like the satisfying part is you get to see them find their inner strength and like overcome obstacles. And that's like why stories are great, so. And it feels earned. You like, they deserve that happy ending if they ever find it. Okay, let's see. I think we have time for two more questions. All right. All right. Um, Ooh, let's see. What is the most unexpected part of being a writer? Ooh. Unexpected. Hmm. I feel like how much talking in front of people you end up having to do is unexpected. So like a writer is someone who volunteers to be alone in a room for like two years <laughs> doing their own thing. And then we end up at festivals and conferences and talking to people and in signing lines and stuff. And you can tell that like some people learn to adapt and like, it's fine. I feel, feel that both of us have done a good job of this. And some people like, it's really not in their nature. So if you meet an author and they feel like kind of cold or aloof or whatever, it's probably because they're just like terrified. Because <laughs> this is not the kind of person who is necessarily like, I want to be in front of people. <laughs> so, I remind myself of that when I meet like my big legendary like authors that I love the most. I'm like, this not may not be their bag. Like, and that's okay. Yes. Yes. I had to like retrain my brain. I remember going to a festival and going to a party and treating it the way I would treat like a normal party where I just kind of like stand in the corner and talk to one person. Um, Cause I'm just, I'm real introverted. I'm on the shyer side. And then I was like, these are all authors. These are all people who are going to be nice. If I do this, they're going to think I'm stuck up. And I'm like, no. <laughs> like I had to reach. I was like, and I'm not like, I'm just, a, I'm just super nervous. And I was like, but they're probably all nervous too. So I had to like, Oh my God. Yeah. Any collection of authors, all terrified. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I had to retrain my brain. I was like, and as soon as I did, I was like, wait, everybody's nice. Like I haven't like reached out to people. Like anytime I'm at a festival, I feel like you can talk to people and you're instant friends. Like, they're yeah, and you have something very significant in common, which helps a lot. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Did you see one for the last question that you thought would be a good last question? Um, let's see. Do -do. We just have a lot of introverts in the chat is what I'm learning, which is great. Oh, um, yeah. Okay. Here's one. This is Craze for Paws, which I like. How has your writing changed from the time you wrote Divergent to the time you wrote Chosen Ones? Um, if, I mean, not to be like self-centered to pick a question that applies to me, but um, so I feel that mostly Divergent was like the most pared down version of what my writing can be. So I was really focused on clarity at that point and I didn't do a lot of describing and I didn't do um, I didn't do as good a job at developing villains or antagonists, I feel. So I think it's changed in those ways where I try to bring in a lot of richness and depth into the book since then, because my writing style is very straightforward. Um, and I think that's great and it's totally fine and people write in a variety of different ways, but that doesn't mean that you don't describe things and it doesn't mean that you don't try to bring complexity to your world building and to your characters. So I'm working on kind of like filling in books a little bit more which has resulted in them becoming longer. <laughs> I think that's a good result, though. I think everybody likes long books, so. I yeah. That's a good result. Do you feel that you have developed even over the course of writing one series? I think so. For me, it was character. Like, I'm very, like, I love diving into the world. I love diving into the plot. But my characters, um, like, were really, like, thin in my like when I first drafted, like I didn't even know how to do an arc for like my first draft of Caraval. So I spend a lot more time on my characters now. Um, and I learned to like know that like I need to love them if I'm gonna like write them. So I try to like really make sure like I am in love with my characters. Um, so, and I think we're gonna get cut off. So I don't oh, yeah. want us to get cut off, um, but oh my gosh, thanks for letting me ask you all the questions. This was so fun. Thanks for joining me and thanks everyone for coming. This was really fun. It was. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Bye. Bye.